Alrighty, so we are wrapping up um, World War II um, with Module 16, which is um, changes on the home front. Um, you have a reading in your uh, primary sources about the four freedoms, and this connects um, FDR's policies of um, the New Deal with um, World War II. So there were four freedoms, freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of worship, and freedom of speech that he felt were indicative of the American um, American society and were really the freedoms that Americans enjoyed. What's important about this is to think about how this connects to um, the Great Depression, what Americans were going through during the Great Depression, but then also what they're going through um, during World War II on the home front. So how do Americans express um, the four freedoms? How do they express support for the war effort? There are a number of different ways. Um, American men would often go, would, would obviously go off and serve. They were drafted. Um, but those that, that stayed behind or who, who were not able to, to be drafted, they were too old or um, had some sort of um, disqualifying or exempted um, trait, would often go to work in the factories. Um, but also women began to really um, move into the factories as well. So Americans were asked to ration. Um, this was to conserve materials and accept either ration coupons or stamps that limited the, the purchase of certain goods. <coughs> of course, gasoline, rubber, sugar, butter, and certain clothing material um, fell into that category. Um, some of the clothing material was nylon, um, which was used um, in the 40s um, for women's hosiery. And so many women either didn't wear hose or they would sometimes color their legs with shoe polish um, to make it look like they were wearing hose um, because they were still part of um, women's fashion. Inflation and food prices, um, Roosevelt was certainly concerned about the rise in food costs. And so he asked Congress to come with a stabilization bill in order to keep prices in check. Um, he also encouraged Americans to um, grow victory gardens. And victory gardens were actually kind of an interesting thing because some households would have them, um, some communities would have a community-wide victory garden, as this picture here indicates. Um, so it was a way for communities to um, kind of get together and work towards the, the common goal of the war effort. Um, it also was very good in terms of supplying Americans with um, fruits and vegetable or, or vegetables, some fruits, I guess, um, and augment their um, the the meats and things that they were getting from um, the grocery stores through rationing. Women, of course, um, you have the Rosie the Riveter picture on the right hand side. Um, women, of course, go into the factories. Initially, industries weren't really seeing a potential labor shortage, but then as companies began to get larger and larger contracts from the government for production, um, they began to hire women. And so they would train women. Um, oftentimes they would um, encourage them to wear uniforms. Um, they would, there's like a, a kind of a movement to create um, form fitting um, uniforms for women um, that didn't look so much like men. Um, you have a, a propaganda campaign kind of surrounded around Rosie the River, the idea of women were loyal, efficient, patri patriotic, and pretty. And so this was their way of going into the, the workforce for the war, work, for the war effort. Um, half of the women who took the jobs were already in the job market. They were just in low paying jobs. And so once the men went off to fight, they were able to move into higher paying jobs. Um, and many of these were women who were um, lower class women or minorities. In terms of um, service, many women um, joined the military um, auxiliaries. And um, the WAS were, were the auxiliary to the United States Air Force. Um, they had a flying training detachment and an auxiliary ferrying squadron. 
And basically what these women would do is they would fly planes from one base to the other, um, maybe from the factory to the airfield. Um, and there were about a, a little over a thousand um, of these women um, from an application pool of 25,000 women, which is really amazing. Um, but it freed up the men in order to fly into combat. The majority of the women were white. Um, you had two Mexican-American women, two Chinese-American women, and one Native American woman um, who served. The only African-American woman to apply was asked to withdraw her application. So segregation is still unfortunately very much a part of um, the auxiliaries. The WAVES were the service organization or the auxiliary for um, the Navy. Um, they were a branch of the Naval Reserve and they allowed the recruitment of women as commissioned officers and enlisted. So officers were typically between 20 and 49. They had a college degree or at least two years of professional or business experience. Um, enlisted women were between 20 and 35 with a high school diploma or, again, equivalent assistance. Most of them were white, but they had about 72 African-American women who did serve in a fully integrated basis, which is pretty um, interesting because the Navy itself was not integrated. Um, African-American men were serving in the Navy, but they were serving below deck. Um, they were not allowed to... to serve aboard uh, above decks. They were the, um, you know, the, the janitors, the porters, the cooks, um, and all of that stuff. Um, Waves served at 90 shore locations in the U.S. Um, and the Judge Advocate General took on Waves who had previously been attorneys. At its peak, the Waves had almost 87,000 women serving. It's pretty big. Um, the Women's um, Army Corps, the WACs, um, were the Army Auxiliary. Um, you had over 150 women serving in um, the Women's Army Corps um, during World War II. Um, Oveta Culp Hobby was the leader, and that's her picture down at the bottom uh, left. Um, and she was kind of the, the head of the organization. Um, and she ends up, um, I believe, getting a, a commission. Um, she's the first secretary of the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Um, but she earned a rank of colonel and became the first woman in the Army to earn the Distinguished Service Medal. Um, the WACs were first used for basic training skills, um, switchboard operators, mechanics, and bakers. Um, the skills training expanded um, to include postal clerks, drivers, stenographers, and typists as well, and then also seamstresses. Um, and the WACs were also present at Normandy just weeks after D-Day. So they were kind of the logistics um, arm for the Army. <clears throat> and then um, the SPARs. The SPARs were the auxiliary of the um, Coast Guard, and the SPAR, the name SPAR comes from Semper Operatus, which means always prepared. But they were established by Congress and signed into law in 1942. Um, between the age of, I think this is probably um, for officers between 20 and 50, but they required a, a college degree um, or two years of experience. Initially, you had only white women serving, but later African Americans were allowed in. Um, their purpose was to release officers and men for sea duty and replace them with women on shore stations. And so um, women served in every Coast Guard district, including Hawaii and Alaska, except for Puerto Rico. And at the maximum number, they had 11,000 officers and enlisted personnel. That's, that's pretty large. Um, in March 1943, the Coast Guard moved the enlisted training to the Biltmore, the former Biltmore Hotel. In Florida during World War II, um, most of the hotels were converted to training centers or barracks um, because tourism had fallen off um, because of rationing. And so um, the Coast Guard training center at the Ponce de Leon Hotel, which is now Flagler College, in St. Augustine housed both men and women. So there were spars at um, the Ponce de Leon Hotel as well. 
So one of the things that comes up um, during um, World War II on the home front is this um, contrast between what they call the good girl and the bad girl. Um, the good girl was one that would serve um, maybe in an auxiliary unit, but also maybe serving in the USO as what they called Liberty Bells, which were young women who would dance with the soldiers when they were on Liberty and they would come to these USO clubs. Um, there were concerns about venereal disease, um, and so it allowed government officials to kind of to monitor the sexual habits of young women. Um, and there's a great deal of um, focus on the women as opposed to the men um, in their concern for venereal diseases. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but in these pictures, you see these women who are um, you know, nice looking, well kept, um, can present themselves very well. But you know, certainly the Liberty Bells were young women who were meeting these soldiers, but they weren't supposed to be going home with them um, or doing anything inappropriate with them. They were just supposed to remind the men of the good, wholesome girls that were in America waiting for them when they come home. The bad girl, however, um, did go home with the soldiers um, and also spread venereal diseases. But um, this is kind of, a, again, the situation where um, women are under the microscope as opposed to the men. And so Florida during World War II, with a large number of military bases that we have or had, um, comes under scrutiny because it was the, had the highest um, venereal disease rate um, within the country. And so Florida starts to enact some policies in order to keep or to get the venereal disease rate down. And so they work with hotel operators and liquor stores where they would literally refuse a room to a single woman um, or refuse to, to sell her alcohol. Um, now, if the man walked in, totally different story. But because the woman um, comes in by herself, um, that was questionable. Now, hotel operators would often um, ask for you know the, the couple if they were married, um, that sort of thing. But of course, that doesn't really hold a lot of water. But um, of course, the the main force of um, all of this agreement was to monitor what single women were doing. Um, and most women that they suspected who might be prostitutes um, were arrested for charges like vagrancy and loitering because prostitution wasn't illegal um, until 1943. And so um, if they were found to have a disease, they were sent to one of these rapid training, or I'm sorry, rapid treatment centers that would give them the antibiotics or the, the medicine in order to treat the disease. Um, in 1944, penicillin comes around and, and it does wonders in terms of, of fighting off venereal diseases. But when I say that treatments for the rapid treatment centers, um, this was both for men and women because men who were found to have venereal diseases were sent to these quarantine facilities, both men and women, to quarantine, quarantine facilities. Obviously, they were segregated by sex and color um, in Florida. Um, and so you would undergo this treatment. And really, before penicillin comes along, the treatment for venereal diseases was was pretty horrific. Um, usually involved you suffering through um, with the disease um, until they could, could get it cleared up. Um, so yay for penicillin, I guess. <laughs> anyway. Um, the war on race, we talked a little bit about this before, that race becomes an issue within the within World War II. Of course, on the home front, you have Japanese Americans who were who were sent to internment camps on the West Coast. Um, a lot of these people were given little notice in terms of moving, so they were grabbing what they could, um, leaving everything else behind. Um, and it's a tragic story because a lot of them lost their land, lost their homes, because they would come back years later and the homes were occupied by another family. So, um, you know, very often it did not end well. 
In terms of Native Americans, Native Americans were used um, as code talkers because the Navajo language was what the code, the American um, code was based on. Of, based on. The Iroquois Nation declared war on the Axis powers, so as a uh, show of solidarity with the American government, um, they made that declaration. Um, Native Americans took advantage of the jobs in the wartime economy, moved into the, the cities or wherever the jobs were, um, and they were close to about 25,000 Native Americans that served um, in World War II, and that made them eligible for the GI Bill, so they were able to take advantage of that. Mexican Americans also took advantage of the wartime economy. The Bracero program was designed to provide decent housing and wages to Mexican Americans um, in order to help fill the labor shortage, um, mostly around uh, migrant farming. Um, <coughs> but the agreement was that they could be deported at any point in time. So there was no security in terms of being within this program. Um, the Zutsu riots in 1943 took place in um, Los Angeles. You had soldiers who were making fun of calling some of the Mexican-American Mexican boys names, and so it launches into a full-scale riot. And it's seen as kind of the, um, the end point for a lot of the frustration and venting of a lot of the frustration that a lot of Mexican-Americans had about being considered second-class citizens or being second-class because they weren't quote-unquote legal. Um, in some cases, though, you do have some that are legal, um, but of course, they're not seen that way. They're kind of cast as, as illegals. Um, Mexican-Americans um, workers also are able to take advantage of um, a lot of the opportunity um, presented by the, by the wartime economy, and so they gain a great deal of rights as well. Um, the United States is in a point where they really do need Mexican-American labor, and so they're able to leverage that in order to get a number of um, rights earned. Of course, it's not citizenship, but they are able to, to gain um, better working conditions and pay. Um, they also are able to use the Fair Employment Practices Commission, which we'll talk about in a second, um, in order to file complaints about discrimination as well. As in World War I, we have a great migration. Um, and this is a period from 1940 to 1970. Very similar patterns that we've seen before, um, most of them going up into the north following the railroads. Um, but you also have new places that are beginning to pop up, like San Francisco, Oakland, Portland, Seattle, Los Angeles, Denver, Minneapolis. These are places where there are um, companies that are getting large contracts from the government to produce war material. And so um, African Americans as well as uh, Mexican Americans are taking advantage of this and moving to the cities. Um, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of movement, um, the darker green is a large scale gain. Um, the lighter green is kind of a, a smaller gain. Um, the red is a, is a loss, so a loss of population um, in terms of African Americans. And so it's interesting that places like Oklahoma and Arkansas have these um, large numbers of losses in 1940 to 1950. Um, West Virginia between 1950 and 1960 is negative 22, um, negative 25 in 1960 to 1970. So um, a lot of this is geared around the proximity to um, other urban areas where there are jobs. Um, certainly the, num the number um, of people in West Virginia leaving um, seems to um, increase like if you're looking at Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, those are seeing significant um, increases. So a lot of it has to do with proximity to other places as well. So African-Americans view World War II a little bit differently. 
Um, and they launched what they call the, the Double V campaign, um, which was actually named by a black magazine, I believe, or newspaper. Um, but the idea was that you would have victory at home as well as victory abroad. Victory against fascism and um, hatred um, at home as well as abroad. So A. Philip Randolph is a um, civil rights activist who began developing the idea of a march on Washington during World War II. And the idea was to raise awareness of working conditions, wages, and jobs for African Americans. And FDR gets wind of this, um, probably through Eleanor, um, and meets with Randolph and some of the members of um, the March on Washington movement. And he agrees to make a concession to them in the event that they would not hold this march because he was afraid that it would undermine the war effort. And so FDR um, issues Executive Order 8802, which allowed for the creation of the Fair Employment Practices Committee. Um, and basically they were in charge of hearing discrimination complaints from companies that had federal contracts. So, you know, if it were like GE and they had a contract to produce something for the American government, if the workers felt like, if African Americans or even Mexican American workers felt like they were being discriminated against, they could lodge a complaint with the Fair Employment Practices Committee. Because again, think about it, if it's just any company, the federal government really doesn't have any say so. But if it's one that has a federal contract, then um, yes, then they can recommend a change. The um, Congress of International Organizations um, also goes through racial integration. They are welcoming black workers during this time period and growing in number. And the AFL um, still is ostracizing them. And what will eventually happen is, of course, the merger between the AFL-CIO um, into one organization. Interesting cartoon down here on the left. It says, listen, maestro, if you want the real harmony, use the black keys as well as the white. And if this looks somewhat familiar, um, this is a cartoon by Dr. Zeus. Um, Dr. Zeus was actually um, doing a lot of cartoons um, around social issues um, during World War II. <coughs> so continuing on this idea of the war on race, um, you have some resistance, especially from the South, but also in, in the Midwest, um, to um, advances within civil rights. Um, we could call this massive resistance, but um, and that's what we, we call it later on in the 1950s and 60s. But many people believe that the, that the war did not bring about um, the right conditions for us to, to completely throw color, the color line out the window. In other words, um, this was not the time for major social change. Um, you had a number of African Americans who disagreed. And so the D Detroit race riot of June 20th, 1943, which was mentioned in one of the flyers um, that the Japanese used to drop on the African American soldiers, by the way, um, that I mentioned in the previous uh, module, um, started out because there was a story that a, a black man had raped a white woman. And so um, the whites came out in force, blacks came out in force, and, it, and, it, um, and they collided. Um, and so this becomes kind of a blemish on the, the face of the United States while they're engaging in this war against fascism. Um, this poster on the right-hand side is exactly kind of that, that in the spyglass, in the, in the um, glass of the man, you see a, a man hanging, which is of course meant to talk about lynching. Um, and that this is, is the enemy. Germany is the enemy, but so is um, racial violence. Gunder Myrdal is a Swedish um, sociologist who writes a book called An American Dilemma. Um, and what he is referring to is the racial history of the United States. And he refers to, to the dilemma as being a um, disagreement between um, American values and America's racial past. That America is not living up to 
its ideals and to its um, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I guess in the ideals and the founding, what the founding fathers wanted. Um, one bright thing out of this slide is that um, the white primary um, is overthrown by the Supreme Court of the United States. Smith versus Allwright um, is a challenge to having a white primary of essentially where candidates are chosen by white voters only. Um, and this was seen by the Supreme Court as um, unconstitutional. And so the white primary is done away with. So lastly, we'll talk about post-war America. What is post-war America going to look like? Um, and the phrase that gets kind of thrown around quite a bit is full employment. <coughs> so one of the big concerns um, of America is that once the war ends, what will happen when the soldiers come back? And so in 1946, you have this bill called the Full Employment Bill of 1946 that um, stated that the government will do whatever it can do to promote full employment and declared, full, de declared employment as a right of every American. Um, it required the president to submit an annual economic report in addition to the national budget and ensure that policies were in place to ensure full employment. Um, of course, the GI Bill is passed in 1944, just prior to the employment bill, um, in which soldiers are given the opportunity um, to be able to go back to school. They, they can have payments of tuition and living expenses to attend high school, vocational school, or college. They can get low cost mortgages, low interest loans to start a business, and they get one full year of unemployment compensation. So this was presented, this GI Bill was presented um, to Congress by members of the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars um, in order to avoid the problem that they had um, with the bonus march from World War I, that there has to be some sort of allocation to the servicemen to get them to, to come back from war, and, and they call it the Readjustment Act because it's really what they're doing. They're readjusting the men to become um, productive members of society. And so really this, this bill provides a great deal of support um, for the soldiers who are coming back. 